In the late 1800s, the stance of women in society was far from equal to men. Women were victims of discrimination due to gender roles of the time. Urged to stay at home, women were responsible for cleaning, cooking, and raising their children. This time period was a largely male-dominant society. Before 1891, husbands could legally beat their wives. In fact, wife beating was not only permitted, but actually encouraged at the time. It showed the authority of husbands over their wives. The one restriction that men did have, however, was that the stick they used must have been no wider than a thumb. During the mid-19th century, the use of alcohol was blamed for the actions of the accused in many severe wife-beating cases. This resulted in the formation of temperance groups, with members who believed that the prohibition of alcohol could solve many problems in Canada. The women's suffragist movement also began during this time period, as women started to lobby for their right to vote as equal members of society. Ideologies were beginning to change and people started to believe that beating was not the answer for pressurizing women into obedience. This gradual change of mindset brought a few changes across Canada. Near the beginning of the 20th century, universities like Oxford University started to accept wealthy women. Although they were educated separate from men, this acceptance led to women who were the first to pursue their own careers. Grace Annie Lockhart was the first woman in the British Empire to earn a university degree, Clara Brett Martin was the first to practice law, and Emily Stowe was the first Canadian woman to practice medicine as a doctor in Canada. These events are significant because they marked the beginning of many changes that occurred in order to recognize women as equal counterparts to men. In 1901, 15% of women 14 and up were part of the labor force, mainly working as seamstresses, teachers, and other domestic positions. Not many women were independents. Women really got a taste of their true potential with the arrival of World War I. This is important because without the opportunities that they received during this time, women may never have gotten out of their houses. In a broad sense, women served equally to men in the war, despite all of the restrictions that they had enforced on them. 3,141 nursing sisters were enrolled in the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps and over 1,000 women were also working for the Royal Air Force. Since most able working men were fighting in the war, jobs that were generally for men were passed on to women. Most employers preferred single women who didn't have families. More than 30,000 women worked in munition factories, some making shells for war. 5,000 were employed in the civil service, while thousands of others worked in banks, offices, and farms. These women had a little training and were expected to work just as good as any other man. With their newfound taste of independence, women in suffragist movements were determined to win their right to vote even more than they were before. On January 28, 1914, Nellie McClung held a mock parliament in Manitoba to raise awareness and get public support for female suffrage. McClung used satire to get her point across. Posing as the premier, the topic of discussion was if men should have the right to vote. Using pathetic excuses McClung often got from men, McClung gave men a taste of their own medicine. Her strategy was so successful that Manitoba women were the first to be given the right to vote. From 1916 to 1919, white women all across the provinces of Canada, including Manitoba, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, British Columbia, and New Brunswick, were finally allowed to vote in their province. In 1917, according to the Military Voters Act, everyone serving in the war had a right to vote, including nurses. The War Times the Election Act gave white women who were related to soldiers and other women over 21 the right to vote in federal elections. This was a step forward. However, it wasn't good enough because it didn't allow all women to vote. Women of color, aboriginals, or other non-white women not related to men serving in the war couldn't vote. This is important to know because even when women were granted suffrage, others were still facing discrimination. In the 1920s, the Women's Labour League emerged in Canada. Members were workers and housewives who called for pay equity, maternity care, and birth control. Although these propositions seem reasonable from a modern perspective, they were radical for the time, especially since they were coming from women. Children and wives were very vulnerable in the 20s. Family assets were the property of men, so if a woman was to get divorced, she would be left with nothing to live on. Emily Murphy, Canada's first female judge, decided that it was time for change. She argued that Canada required more family equitable laws. The gap between men and women started to narrow with an alteration to the federal divorce law in 1925. The law now stated that women could divorce their husbands on the same grounds as men. One of the most notable cases in Canadian history that changed the world for women forever was the Persons case. In the mid-1800s, the law clearly stated if laws were applicable to males or females. However, between 1822 and 1878, the line between the two genders started to blur. The word he was adequate enough to include women in laws. After 1850, the term person was only interchangeable with male. These early discrepancies caused problems to arise later on and led to the person's case. 
According to Section 24 of the British North America Act, the highest source of law in Canada, only qualified persons could be selected to be in the Senate. The term person had always been interpreted as male until then. Emily Murphy, the first Canadian female judge, was infuriated when she learned that women weren't considered to be persons in Canada. According to a provision in the Supreme Court of Canada, anyone could petition against any interpretation of the Constitution with a group of five people. Emily Murphy led the fight against the Canadian government along with her four Albertan friends, Nellie McClung, Henrietta Edwards, Louise McKinney, and Irene Parley. Together, Murphy and her acquaintances petitioned against the claim that women could not be part of the Senate. The case was debated on March 14, 1928. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled that women weren't considered to be qualified persons. This event in particular is very significant to the development of women's rights. According to this ruling, women weren't even considered to be persons, let alone equal to men. After their failure at the Supreme Court, the famous five had not given up. The ladies took their case to a force even higher than the Supreme Court of Canada, the Privy Council in England. It was here where history had changed its course. The famous five were granted their much-awaited victory when the Privy Council ruled that women were indeed persons in society. Lord Sankey, the judge at the council that day, stated, The exclusion of women from all public offices is a relic of days more barbarous than ours. By saying these few words, he made it clear that old traditions and sly legal arguments would no longer repress the development of women's rights. In the 1930s, 19.4% of women 14 years and up were part of the labor force. Women also saw another step towards gender equality when the federal divorce laws were changed yet again. Deserted women were now allowed to sue for divorce. Another unprecedented event occurred during this time, and it was the appointment of Karen Wilson to the Senate of Canada. She was the first female senator, largely due to the hard work of the famous five. Other rights that women were fighting for around this time include abortion and birth control. In 1928, Dorothea Palmer was arrested for educating women about birth control. In 1932, Dr. Elizabeth Bagshaw opened Canada's first family planning clinic, despite the fact that it was illegal at the time. Such topics were not to be discussed in public. From 1939 to 1945, women were needed yet again for wartime production in ammunition plants, factories, and shipyards due to World War II. Similar to World War I, employers still preferred single women. However, since the demand for production was increasing rapidly, employers were forced to employ married women. This work allowed women to achieve financial independence and made women realize that they could work and take care of their children at the same time. This disproved the typical justification for why women belonged at home. After this war, women didn't let themselves be pushed back into their stereotypical positions in society, unlike World War I. In 1951, the International Labour Organization passed Convention 100, which called for pay equity, equal pay for equal work. Although the federal government and a number of provinces passed equal pay legislations between 1951 and 1959, Canada did not give formal consent to Convention 100 until 1972. This is significant because pay equity is still a problem today. The fact that efforts to formally end the gender gap is only around 50 years old is disheartening. Despite all of the breakthroughs in the world of women, it wasn't until 1960 that all women were permitted to vote regardless of colour, language, or original nationality. This is yet another benchmark in Canadian history as women were seen to be more equal to men. From 1960 to 1985, a women's liberation movement broke out across the whole world. Women called for pay equity, equal job opportunities, and the elimination of sexual harassment and sexual exploitation. By this time, it had been established that women had the right to have any right that men had, since they were just as able and capable. This event is very important because it is still relevant in today's society. In the 1970s, women's salaries were only 59.7% of men. Today, according to recent Statistics Canada data, women only get 74 cents for every dollar a man makes. This improvement shows that Canada is heading in the right direction. In 1981, women's rights were added to Canada's constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, after over 1,000 women were concerned for their rights not being protected. Many other Canadian laws were changed from the 1970s to the 80s due to the hard resolve of women. Alterations were made to labour laws to make paternity and maternity leaves longer. Rape laws were changed to make it illegal for a man to rape his own wife, and restrictive abortion laws were deemed unconstitutional. Canada has moved on from its past and has equal rights for men and women. In 2014, the amount of people in Canada's labour force according to gender were really close with about 10,000 men and 9,000 women. Had women not have fought for their rights in the past, many Canadian women today would still be living in a repressive society. From birth control to voting rights to abortion, marriage and rape laws, Canadian women changed the course of history by standing up for equal rights. Although we still have room to improve, Canada has changed drastically, all thanks to great Canadian women.